So let's pray and start. And if they show up, we will let them in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Father. Thank you for bringing us together once again, Father, this fifth lesson of discovering your lost kingdom. Lord, we need you, Father. We need your help. We need your strength. We need you. Thank you for anointing the words of my mouth. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who have joined this class, this lesson, Father. I bless them. I cancel every assignments of the enemy that gains their life, their mind, their spirit, soul, and body. They are sealed under the blood of Jesus. I rebuke Ed, every enemy and your position, oppression. I thank you for your protection and your favor, Father. Thank you for deliverance, freedom, completely bringing us back to your kingdom, Father. We love you. We honor you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bearing witness in our hearts with your power and your glory. Lord Jesus, you are the teacher. Come and teach us. Make it plain and simple and clear to our hearts, Father, your kingdom and the process of salvation. We love you, Father. We thank you for this privilege. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Well, last week we started this process of salvation. You know, one of the questions that people ask, that people who do not believe in God, one of the questions they ask is, if God is good, why he allows all the evil and wars and accidents and sickness, you know, people die of all kinds of things that people cannot comprehend. Why do they happen? And they blame God for it. You know, if God is good, why he didn't stop the accident? If God was almighty, all powerful, why didn't he save my so-and-so from dying of cancer or abuse that happened? I, I heard of somebody that I know personally that, you know, who was abused sexually when she was a child. She said, why wouldn't God, why didn't God stop that? I was innocent. I didn't deserve this. I didn't, I didn't know any better. I didn't know how to defend myself. Why didn't God protect? protect me from happening that abuse from her own father that horrible things that happens and everybody blames God for it for some reason and if God is love why people have a hard time receiving his love oh my goodness God is love that's what the Bible says love forgives all things never keeps the record of wrongs and what happened to that God why would God become the most misunderstood person on this universe. He is love. He never did anything wrong to anyone. Never did anything injustice. But he is the most misunderstood, blamed person on the universe. And Jesus and the message he brought is the most misunderstood message on the planet Earth. <laughs> Since he never asked anyone if they want to go to heaven. And people still wonder why we keep doing what we are doing when it when we can't find it in the bible the reason all this happened it happened in the garden of eden where did the wrong perception of god started it started in the garden of eden when adam activated a system of living that god never intended for mankind to live by that system is living by the knowledge of good and evil. We were supposed to live by the tree of life, but Adam activated this new system of living, living by the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? If you do good, you'll be accepted and blessed. If you do evil, you will be punished. So ever since Adam activated that system, it changed the perception of God Adam had in his heart. But sin didn't change God's perspective of man. The father that came down in the garden that evening, he didn't come to punish Adam. He didn't come with the sword. 
he didn't come with the fire and brimstone. His question is, where are you, Adam? I came here to meet with you, but you are not here. You're hiding. What happened to you? Because sin caused the perception of God to change in Adam's heart. And ever since, what happened from Genesis chapter 3 to the end of Malachi in the Old, Old Testament is the result of Adam's activating the knowledge of good and evil. That was not God's fault. All those fire and brimstone that we see in the Old Testament, earth opening up, swallowing people, and Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt with fire from heaven is because of the system Adam activated until the end of Malachi. That is the result that we see. It wasn't God's fault, but through the coming of Jesus, what did Jesus say? He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And me and the Father are one. Jesus did not bring any bring firestorm on anybody. He didn't cause anybody to get sickness or accident or even Peter who denied him three times. The Bible says in Gospel of Mark chapter 15, I believe, Peter cursed Jesus. According to the theology I grew up in, if somebody denies Christ, he's gone. He's lost. There's no more salvation for him. His salvation is lost. He's eternally condemned for hell. That is the theology I grew up in. But here, Peter, one of the chief apostles of Jesus Christ, denied him for three times. And do you know what Jesus comes and asks him? Jesus, when he came, he didn't even ask him to repent. Peter, he had to repent seven times about this. Instead, Jesus asked him, do you love me? That is the kind of father. So Jesus came to reveal, to manifest and restore the father we lost in Genesis chapter 3. And that's what we have to go through this process of salvation after we reach the process of the salvation, we have to have the same perspective of God Adam had before the fall. We have to get there in our understanding of God, in our knowledge of God. We have to reach that place where Adam was before the fall. And the perception Adam had about the earth, about himself and God. So we started the process of salvation last week. We went through the born again experience, then the repentance. Now we are at deliverance. What is deliverance? Deactivating, disconnecting, disassociating, and destroying every influence of the devil and his kingdom from our life, beginning with our bloodline. We don't even know where and how the enemy gets a legal right to oppress us different areas of our life the enemy needs a legal right he just won't come and attack you he has no right to do that to a child of god the enemy needs a legal right so how does he gain this legal right maybe through the bloodline conception dna birth birthright some of the actions that we have done so we read that in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, where Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to, to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And then we entered here saying there are 15 major areas that every one of us need to be delivered from. 15 major areas. When we get delivered from this 15 major areas, every legal right of the enemy will be canceled and will be rooted out. And the rest of the deliverance is easy. So the first one, the first area that we need to be delivered from is the system Adam activated when he disobeyed God. The law of the knowledge of good and evil. We are no longer under that system. 
when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you are in God's kingdom, you don't live by that system, by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're, you're restored back to the tree of life, which is Jesus is the tree of life. Because everything in this universe is governed by laws that God has established, whether spiritual or natural. Faith is a law that we read in Romans chapter 2. Love is a law. Sin is a law. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 says, There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, because the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. When the enemy activates or through mankind activates a demonic law, God introduces a superior law. When sin came into this world, that law of sin says every soul that sin must die. That is the law of sin. What did God do? He activated a superior law, a law of life in Christ Jesus. Has set us free from the law of sin and death. Righteousness is a law. Romans chapter 9, I believe, we, we talk about the law of righteousness. That's where Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. As long as we remain in the religious self-righteousness, God's kingdom will not benefit us. I guarantee you. I have seen many people who are so zealous about the kingdom message, but they still remain in their religious self-righteousness mode. So the kingdom message doesn't benefit them. The only way kingdom message will benefit is when we receive the righteousness of God as a gift. And that's a big one. The kingdom and righteousness is both are equally important. One won't work without the other. The second thing we need to be delivered from is the law of sin. How do we get delivered from this? By speaking it, I renounce the law of sin and death from my life. I sever it. I cut it off. And I activate the law of spirit of life in me. I renounce the law of sin. I activate the law of righteousness by faith in my life. That's how you do it, by words, because God's kingdom is governed by words that you speak, that you and I speak. Everything is governed by words. If you believe Satan is going to attack you and you say it with your mouth, guess what? He is going to do it because you authorized him with your words. You gave him the legal right to do it. And then don't blame him. But if you say Satan has no legal right to touch me or what belongs to me, then he has no legal right. You govern your life by the words that you speak. That's where the Bible says life and death are in the power of your tongue. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, you speak to this mountain, you believe in your heart, whatever you say it, it will manifest in your life eventually. It may not manifest the next day. The life that I'm living now, dear children of God, dear brothers and sisters, the life and the ministry God is doing now is the result of the words that I declared when I was 18 years old. When I was 16 years old, every country that God is taking me now is the countries we declared by faith in prayer when I was 16 years old. And it is manifesting now. I didn't know where the money was going to come from. Who was going to pay for it? <laughs> 
It's governed by words. So everybody say, I renounce the law of sin. I activate the law of righteousness by faith in my life. So the third thing that we need to be free from is pride. There are different form of pride, spiritual pride, cultural pride, racial pride. And we live in a culture here in the United States. People will say, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of this. I'm proud of this like 10 times a day. When you say something, I am, it is establishing who you are. And pride originated in the heart of Lucifer. There is nothing good about pride. Father didn't look at Jesus and say, I'm proud of my son. Look at him. That's not what he said. I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So I correct that to people who all wants to listen. Please don't say, I am proud. I am proud. I'm proud of something 10 times a day because that's what you are going to become. I know it's part of the culture because that is the next thing we need to be free from. That is the culture. If we can be free from the culture we grew up in, whether it is religious culture, the culture of the country, the culture of the family we grew up in, and adapt the kingdom culture. That's why God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, get out of your country, your father's house, and your kindred to a land, to a new culture. What are those three things represents? Your country, your father's house, your kindred. Your country represents your culture. Your father's house represents the traditions that you inherited. And the kindred represents people's opinion. Other people have an opinion about you. You have to be free from it. You know, I know people who migrated to the United States from India and other places. They still eat the same thing they ate when they grew up. They won't change. They still need that tapioca. <laughs> Otherwise, they won't fall asleep. Change. Try something new. When you go to a restaurant, order something you never tried before. Get out of your tradition, your culture, the normal thing that you always did. Because if you keep doing what you always did, you keep getting what you always got. Try something new. I don't eat Indian stuff in my home. Once in a while I do. I don't do nothing because the greatest fight I ever went through is to get out of my culture that I grew up in into the kingdom culture. So when I go back to my people now, I don't fit in. You are not supposed to fit in. You're supposed to stand out. <laughs> you don't need to make everybody happy. That's the next thing we have to be free from, the opinion of others. In some culture, they won't try anything new because they're afraid what their uncle would say, what aunt would say, what their neighbor would say. And they will talk themselves out of their assignment and what God told them. And the next thing we need to be free from is the orphan heart. My Lord, my God, we all need to be healed from this orphan heart. What is the orphan heart? Like I mentioned before, last week, you know, we feel like we are not good enough. Nobody loves us. We can't do anything right. Insecurity, rejection, those are all symptoms of the orphan heart syndrome, OHS. That's a new disease, emotional disease, orphan heart syndrome insecurity and rejection when somebody criticizes you your life falls apart for three days because you're so feel rejected you can't stand up and speak in front of a group of people because of insecurity because you feel like they won't love you they won't or fear of rejection 
fear of failure. Those are all symptoms of the orphan heart. I am just running through these points. You need to take time to get free from this. I wish I had time to walk you through deliverance in all these points, but you need to spend some personal time to walk each point through to experience deliverance in your life. Then only you will benefit from it. Just by knowing it, it's not nothing is going to change. You will have to spend some time with God going through these points to be free from it. The next thing we need to be delivered from is religious spirit. If you've been part of any religion, any church, believe me, we are affected by religious spirit. Doesn't matter what church you grew up in, what kind of belief system you had. If you are born on this planet Earth as a human being, you have two spirits that comes with your birth. That is, one is religious spirit, the other one is the spirit of poverty. And we will learn that in a minute about it. The spirit of this world, we need to be free from the spirit of this world. What is the spirit of this world? The spirit of this world always looking for fun and pleasure. That's what the Bible says. People became lovers of pleasure than lovers of God. Always looking for something fun to do, Monday through Friday. And the next thing is the spirit of mammon. What is mammon? The spirit that controls the monetary system of this world. Jesus said there are two masters. One is God or money. And we will live to serve either one of them. We can't serve both of them at the same time. We will hate one or love the other. We'll be loyal to the one or disloyal to the other one. Majority of the people on this earth, they spend a majority of their time trying to make some money. That's what they spend their time for. And Jesus said, that's not how we should be living. We should be living to serve God, his kingdom purpose. Then you will say, Abraham, who will pay for my expenses? Your expenses is covered in the assignment. That's when you need to discover it and start small. You can't wait for a million dollars to show up so you can walk in your kingdom assignment. That's not how it works. The next thing we need to be free from is the spirit of lust. The people of Israel, the Bible says, they lusted after meat and strange flesh while they were in the wilderness. And the judgment of God fell on them. And the spirit of individualism or independence. You know, there's a huge difference between freedom and independence. People like to be independent than being free. Jesus was free, but he was not independent. Freedom is different from being independent. Jesus said, whom the Son set free is free indeed. And he chose to submit to his Father to do his will. Independence says you don't submit to anybody. You do whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, when you feel like doing it. That's not freedom. Independent is of the Babylonian system. Freedom is of the kingdom of God. God wants us to be free. What is true freedom? Freedom is when you are free to fulfill what you are born to do. The spirit of pleasure, fears and insecurities. We all have different fears. Some people are afraid of failures, afraid of fear of people, fear of heights and phobias. As I was flying from South Africa the other day, my, one of my friends said he's afraid of flying. And he asked me, how long does it take me to reach from Johannesburg to New Jersey, Newark, that one flight is 15 hours. He couldn't believe that I could sit in an airplane for 15 hours. <laughs> And he said, as soon as you land, do me a favor, send me a message to make sure that I'm okay. You know what happened? As soon as I got inside that flight, most of those 15 hours I slept. <laughs> when I opened my eyes, 
there is 50 minutes left before landing. Thank God. That was the fastest flight I ever flew. I don't know how that 15 hours went. I closed my eyes. When I opened, it was time to land. Thank God. The spirit of poverty. This is a big one, people of God. Whatever we do, what, whatever we could buy, either we make the decision or the money that we have make the decision for us. Money has a voice. When you, Unless you are free from the spirit of poverty, everything we do, buy, go places will be decided by the money thing, the money devil. We have to be free from it. Don't let money make decisions for you. We have to make God make the decisions for you. What we should buy, where we should eat, where we should live. Don't let money make that decision. Let Holy Spirit make that decision. When I go to a store now, I don't look at the prices of things. I will sense to see if the Holy Spirit wants me to have it or not. If the Holy Spirit says that is the thing you need it, I will get it. That's how I live right now. I don't let money make decisions for me. What should I eat? Where should I eat? Where should I live? And healing from emotional wounds and traumas. It is unexplainable and unimaginable things people go through in their life, even while they're growing up. You know, like I had to he be healed from father wounds. That was a huge thing in me. Because I grew up with a father that who was like a military general. I couldn't ask him any question. If I ask him a question, he will punish me because he will ask me, why didn't you know the answer already? <laughs> and he will beat me for that because I asked him a question. And he was a Pentecostal. So imagine that the concept of God that was formed in me because of the father I had. So when you can go through that deliverance process from all these things, whatever traumas you went through, abuses that you went through, you have to address it. How do you know you are healed from those wounds and traumas? The memories of those experiences won't cause any emotional struggles in you, emotional pain in you. If those memories are still triggering pain in you or a fluctuation of how you feel about yourself, that means there are things that need to be still dealt with. You have to deal with them. You have to dig it out until those memories won't affect your feelings anymore, emotions anymore. That's how you know that you're healed and delivered from. Once you go through that deliverance process, the next, you can go into the next step is redemption. Please do not go to redeem anything until you go through the deliverance process. Otherwise, the enemy will not leave you alone. Because Unless that deliverance process, we cut off every legal rights he has, he won't let us have the things that belongs to us. What is redemption? Receiving or buying back everything we lost or was stolen from us. We don't need to pay the price. Jesus paid the price. The blood of Jesus is the price of our redemption and everything the enemy stole from us, our destiny, our purpose, our inheritance, the kingdom, and the price of it is fully paid. Jesus paid it all. There's nothing more to be paid. That devil has no right to demand any more payments because it is fully paid by the blood of Jesus to the uttermost. Jesus paid it. 
That's where there is redemption, that word re. We are going to learn more about it today. Every word that starts with the prefix re means you're doing it again. So please write those Bible verses so you can, you can read them when you have a cup of coffee in the morning and meditate on it. Once you go through redemption, the next process is restoration. Again, this word starts with the prefix re, returning something or someone to its original owner, purpose, place, and function. That is restoration. Once you go through salvation, you have to go through, you have to be restored back to your original owner, your purpose, and the place of your function, which is kingdom. And that is the purpose of salvation, restoration. Acts chapter 3 verse 21 says, heaven must withhold Jesus until the time of restoration of all things which God has spoken through his holy prophets from time began. That means if there was a prophet, a holy prophet who walked on the earth and prophesied in the name of the Lord, the Bible is saying they prophesied about restoration, not destruction. So that's why all the major doctrines and kingdom concepts of the New Testament starts with the prefix RE, means there is nothing new, it is doing it again. So please write these major doctrines and concepts of the New Testament that starts with the prefix RE. First one is repent. The first word that came out of Jesus' mouth when he started his ministry is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The rest, the next one is return. First Peter 2.25 says return to our chief shepherd. That is Jesus Christ. Restoration. We just read that in Acts chapter 3 verse 21. He is doing it again. It was stored. Now we have to be restored, redeemed. We were deemed by God. We belong to him. The enemy stole us from him. Now we need to be redeemed. It's like you go take your driver's license, you renew your license or your passport. You had it once, now it expired. Now you're renewing it. Renew our mind. Our mind was new. We used to think right about God, about earth, and about ourselves, but sin corrupted our way of thinking. Now our mind needs to be renewed through repentance and go back to the original way of thinking, how Adam used to think before the fall. Rebirth or born again. John chapter 3 verse 3 talks about the born again experience. We were born once naturally, then we have to be rebirthed into God's kingdom. Receive. Jesus said in John chapter 20 verse 22 to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. It means they had the Holy Spirit. We lost it. Now we have to receive it. Reconciliation. Concile means to make one or one. It was one. Then it was broken. Now we have to reconcile between man and God, between Jew and Gentiles. Even though we know and we teach and preach God has reconciled Jew and Gentiles and still people believe and run trying to find their Jewish roots. You don't find your Jewish roots, you find your kingdom roots. Where Adam was, Adam was not a Jew. He was not a Caucasian, African or Asian. He was a son of God. There was no Africa or Asia in the garden, earth was one continent. Earth was divided later into continents in the time the Chronicles was written. He was a son of God. That's our identity. Restitution, Acts chapter 3 verse 21 in the King James, it talks about restitution instead of restoration. Regeneration, generate means 
create or increase, generate income, generate power, generator. We heard of power generator, you know, now we have to be regenerated. Our spirit man needs to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Release. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, 15 says, Jesus defeated the death to set those who are free, who have been held captive by the fear of death. The greatest fear is fear of death. So Jesus came to release us from that. Recover. Mark 16, 18 says to recover those who, if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's the word used in New King James in Mark chapter 16. The next is reward. We receive a reward at the end for doing what God has created us to do. And the last one is resurrection. We were resurrected before. Now we have to be resurrected because we were dead. Now, when Christ comes back, we'll be resurrected. So all these major doctrines and kingdom concepts of the New Testament starts with the prefix re, means doing it again. So New Testament is not something new. New Testament is doing it again, what we lost to restore what Adam lost when he fell. So the next process in the salvation is transformation. What is transformation? Dramatic outward change by manifesting the new man or the new creation within. In the kingdom, the change starts within us first. It's inside out, not outside in. Religion tells us the change starts outside. We try to change people's clothing and what they wear and jewelry. That's the kind of background I grew up in. The Pentecostalism is all about outward change. That's how we know what is religion. Religion always focuses on the outside. Kingdom focuses on the inside. The change has to start within. Then it has to manifest outside. Just because you lit seven candles in some temple or church building, that's not what God is looking for. He is looking for the change that has to happen inside us. And after we go through the transformation, the manifestation comes revealing kingdom sonship and kingdom realities to the creation around us. Once we go through this process, that's when the change will manifest through us outside to the to the nature to the creation around us right now why there is no transformation happening because we haven't gone through this process yet we're still fighting about who's the greatest in the kingdom about our color and creed and our belief system and what song to sing and how many songs to sing on a sunday morning we are still fighting about it So once we go through that process of salvation, our purpose is reinstated. And our concept of God is reconstructed. We will begin to have the right perception of God, the Father, that Jesus came to reveal and restore and manifest. So the next big lesson that we need to understand the new testament jesus revealed seven dimensions of the kingdom of god why people get so confused about the kingdom message because what jesus said and how he said it sometime he said the kingdom of god is near you then he said the kingdom of god is within you then he said the kingdom of god is, is going to come so which one is true <laughs> So people get confused about the kingdom message and they threw it out of the window. So the first concept or the dimension Jesus came to reveal is when he began his ministry by announcing that the kingdom is near or at hand. That is the kingdom we lost when Adam sinned. That kingdom is near. That's what he announced. 
So the Pharisees asked him, when does the kingdom come? How does it come? How do we know? And Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, 20 to 21, kingdom of God does not come with observation because the kingdom of God is within us. Every human spirit is created after God's image and likeness who is king. And he has a kingdom. We carry God's kingdom in our spirit, man. Each of us were designed as kingdom builders. God put an aspect of his kingdom in our spirit, man, and depends on which spirit world we are connected, either God's kingdom or the demonic kingdom, depends the kind of kingdom we manifest. If a human being is connected to the demonic world, the kingdom they manifest will be the kingdom of darkness. If a human being is connected to God and the Holy Spirit, the kingdom they manifest will be God's kingdom. Either way, we are created as kingdom builders. The only thing we know how to do is to build a kingdom. That's why 500 years ago, there were only kingdoms on this earth. How did they come up with kingdom idea? Because their spirit man is fashioned, created after God, who is a king, who was a kingdom. So whatever we do, we are building a kingdom from morning till evening. So the third dimension that Jesus said, the kingdom that we see when we are born again. Jesus said, unless we are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you will see an aspect of God's kingdom that he wants you to manifest on the earth. It's like seeing a country. Kingdom of God is a country, as you already know. We say, I have seen the United States or I have seen South Africa. I didn't see the whole South Africa when I was there. I saw only the part of South Africa that is connected to my assignment. The same way with God's kingdom, there is no way in this lifetime or in the next lifetime we will see the whole God's kingdom. No, we will only see the kingdom that is connected to our personal individual assignment. You will see either kingdom economy, kingdom government or kingdom agriculture, education or something that God wants you to manifest on the earth as part of his kingdom. That's what you will see when you're born again. The fourth dimension of God's kingdom that Jesus revealed is the kingdom that is hidden in the world. This world and everything in it was fashioned and created by Jesus Christ and for him, through him, and by him. But it is hijacked by the devil and his kingdom. But it was fashioned and created by our King Jesus. There's a, there's a kingdom of God hidden in this world system, even in this fallen state. That's where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That field in Matthew chapter 13 represent, represents the world. If you read the whole chapter, you will understand it. Matthew chapter 13. That's the kingdom parable chapter. The fifth dimension that Jesus revealed is the kingdom of God that is upon us. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon us. The sixth dimension, which is my favorite one. He said, the kingdom of God that came on the day of Pentecost in Mark chapter 9 verse 1. Matthew 16, 28, Luke chapter 9, verse 27, Jesus said, there are some standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God comes with power. And he was talking to the audience, listening to him that day, some of them will not die until they see. That means it has to happen in their lifetime, not 2,000 years later. If it was so, they wouldn't be alive to see it. Nobody lived even thousand years since Adam. 
What was Jesus talking about? He was talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He is the governor general of the kingdom of God. He came with God's kingdom. Holy Spirit comes to help us administer his kingdom. And ever since God's kingdom again began to operate on the earth through the Holy Spirit. And the seventh dimension of God's kingdom is the kingdom of God as a country. When Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come means let his country come to our country to colonize. And in Matthew 25, it's talking about kingdom of God as a country with the king. So those are, those are the seven dimensions of God's kingdom revealed in the New Testament. I have a whole book called the seven dimensions and operations of the kingdom of God. So we just learned about the restoration of the kingdom. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. So I'm just going to click through that because we already read through the scriptures many times before. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. I just said that Matthew 16, 28, Luke 9, 27, that some standing here will not taste death. Now, this is the one important concept to understand the difference between kingdom and grace. In the recent time, the whole body of Christ got excited about the message of grace. You might have heard it, right? What is grace? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. So what comes first, the kingdom or grace? The kingdom comes because we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us have grace. So what is the difference between kingdom and grace? Kingdom is the country. Grace is the system of governing. So in God's kingdom now, he governs his kingdom through his grace. So kingdom is the country. Grace is the governing system. Or kingdom is the hardware. Grace is the software. Which one is important? We, we need both. You can have the most powerful software on the planet. But if there is no hardware to operate it, it's useless. But you can have the most powerful hardware, but there's no software to operate that hardware. It doesn't do any good. So we need both. You cannot separate God's kingdom and grace message. You have to give them both to people. Jesus did not come to preach about grace. He was full of grace, but he came to preach about the kingdom. That's the only message his father authorized him to preach. And he authorized the disciples to preach. That is the kingdom. In his kingdom, there is grace. So why don't God pour out his spirit now as he did? People are crying and doing all sorts of whining to God, you know, Lord, why you don't pour out a spirit? It's not because he's not willing to pour out a spirit. He's always ready and willing to pour out a spirit. But why? See, Jesus had to come to this planet Earth, preach and teach and prepare a group of people before God would pour out his spirit upon that people. He has to prepare them with the message of the kingdom. Because the Holy Spirit comes to administer the kingdom of God, not to make us feel good and clap and jump and roll on the floor. That's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to make noise. Holy Spirit comes to help us administer his kingdom. And if there is nobody to administer his kingdom, God won't pour out his spirit. It is that simple. If we do what Jesus did, Prepare a group of people for his kingdom. God will pour out his spirit. So 
let's check on the misunderstandings about the kingdom. Why there's such a resistance about to the message of the kingdom? Why people don't preach about the kingdom? Because the misunderstanding. Because people think miracles and healings are kingdom. That's not the kingdom. That They are the signs of the kingdom. Just like when you're driving to a place, you will see signs. 15 miles or 25 miles more to the place you're going. These are signs, but that is not the place. So kingdom is the country. Jesus said, go and heal the sick, cast out demons, and then tell them the kingdom of God is near. Means it's not there yet. But they were still doing those miracles. The second misunderstanding of the kingdom is Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So his kingdom cannot be on the earth right now. That's not what he said. When Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, he meant my kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. It is coming from heaven to earth. It is from another world. That's what he meant. He never said, my kingdom is not in this world. But he said it is not like the kingdoms of this world, like the kingdom of Alexander or United Kingdom. The third misunderstanding of God's kingdom is there's no food or natural things in the kingdom because it's all spiritual. When Paul said, kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So there is no food in the kingdom. We're supposed to be starving and dying, right? No, Jesus said, I will not taste the fruit of this wine until I sit in my Father's kingdom. And God poured out manna from heaven for 40 long years and fed his people. There is plenty of food in his kingdom because his kingdom feeds the entire kingdom creation seeking god's kingdom means doing ministry or getting baptized or that's another misunderstanding about god's kingdom seeking god's kingdom is not going to the street and witnessing to people or trying to help some poor people that's not kingdom that is all part of the kingdom every kingdom has a welfare department every country has a welfare department but that's not the whole country getting baptized is not seeking god's kingdom that's just obeying one of the doctrines of the new testament kingdom means going to church on sundays just because you go to church on a sunday that doesn't mean you are in god's kingdom Kingdom means getting closer to God. God lives in you. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. How do we get to how do we get closer to somebody who is living in you? Our perception changes. When strongholds are broken, we feel we are closer to God, but He was living in you the whole time. kingdom will come the next misunderstanding is the kingdom will come only during the millennial reign there's no kingdom now because god told us to take a break where you read that in the new testament jesus said my kingdom is taking a break now it's going to come only during the millennial time no bible says his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures throughout all generation. Every generation is part of God's kingdom and God's kingdom is active in every generation. And the last but not the least is the misunderstanding is kingdom is only for the Jewish people. This kingdom message Jesus brought was only meant for the Jewish people and Gentiles have nothing to do with it. If it was so, why would Jesus say, Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, in every nation as a witness, then the end will come. 
Then Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses, not just in Jerusalem, but in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus sent them to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth, not just for the Jewish people. So why Jesus told us to seek his kingdom first? Why didn't he tell us to go to church first or get to baptized first? Because man is designed and created to live in and build a kingdom. Like I mentioned before, our spirit man, because we are created in the image and likeness of God, who is a king, he has a kingdom, we are fashioned after him. We are designed to, to live in and build a kingdom. The second reason why Jesus told us to seek his kingdom first, because mankind is worried about their basic needs. Everybody is worried about what they're going to eat, where they're going to live, how they're going to provide for themselves. He said to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. And he said, do not worry about what you're going to eat. Where are you going to live? Jesus knows the side effect of worry and stress. Worry and stress are the root cause of many illness today. Eventually, our body will break down because of stress and worry. Mankind is searching for a lost country. Ever since Adam lost the garden, which was God's kingdom, people began to migrate from one country to the other. Poor country to rich country, underdeveloped country to developed country. What they are searching for is not this developed country or rich country. Their spirit man is longing for God's kingdom. One thing I realized is when I came to the United States, people here are also looking for a lost country. They also want to go somewhere else. They're always moving from one community, one city to the next, one house to the bigger house, and their search is not over. What they're looking is not for a bigger house or a vacation home somewhere. Their spirit man is longing for the lost kingdom. And mankind is longing for a righteous government. We elect our political leaders every four years thinking that this time they are going to do it right, right? And they haven't figured it out yet. But that will change only when God's kingdom government manifests on the earth. Social and racial problems among mankind. We just went through this huge issue here in the United States about George Floyd and BLM and this and that. Why? Why there is racial division before, among people? Because we lost the kingdom. We began to judge and decide people based on their color of their skin, not in whose image they are created. And it is the priority of Jesus. Jesus came with the kingdom message, and that's his priority. So next week when we come back, we are going to study about the benefits of seeking God's kingdom and how do we seek it? Jesus told us to seek his kingdom. How do we do it? That's what we will discover next Monday when we come back. Father, we thank you for this word that you shared with us today about your kingdom, Father, the seven dimensions and the process of salvation. Help us to go through that process, Father, the areas that we need to be delivered from the areas that the enemy is hiding from us, things that needs to be revealed, everything that is belongs to the darkness in us must be revealed, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you for bringing them to light. When the light comes, darkness leaves, Father. I bless your people with breakthrough and deliverance and freedom in those areas, emotional freedom, physical freedom, and spiritual freedom, Father, because your son says, whom the son set free is free indeed. Thank you, son of God, for setting us free. 
in every area of our life. I thank you for your peace and your grace. We love you. We honor you. Let this word that we heard today remain in our hearts for all eternity and for the generations to come. And let it bring forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Hi, Angela. How are you? Angela, Nervely, and they all came in late. I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. Good to see you. And got, got us aromaticas. Oh my goodness, I don't think I have seen that name before. DK, is that Denmark? Eleanor, welcome. Hope you can hear me. Uh oh, did I freeze everyone? My Oh, I'm sorry. My Wi-Fi got disconnected and sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. So any questions or comments, feedback from what you heard today? Any questions, any comments, any feedback? This is the fifth lesson. We have one more left next week. Can't believe probably five weeks is gone. Question. Yes. So the king, the kingdom, we will put it like if it's the Garden of Eden, or is there a place called the Garden of Eden? <laughs> Garden of Eden was the physical manifestation of God's kingdom on the earth. There okay. are four times God's kingdom and His will manifest on the earth. So one was in the Garden of Eden. Okay. Second time it was in the in the wilderness when the people of God came out of Egypt. The Bible says they didn't age, you know, they their their clothes didn't deteriorate, mm -hmm. their sandals didn't get worn out. They were in this special atmosphere, and God fed them for 40 years. Then in the okay. promised land, well, there's the promised land, even especially during David's time. He's the man who established God's kingdom and his will on the earth. God's kingdom manifested in Israel during that time. They, are, they, they were at the pinnacle of their blessing and God's favor during David's time. Then the fourth time God's kingdom and will manifested was in the early church. Where 5,000 people were there. There was nobody who was sick or with an unmet need. Okay. okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions, feedback, comments? So please don't forget to introduce the Kingdom School to two of your friends and ask them to sign up, please. And also actually Eleanor, I had I had introduced Eleanor. She's not talking, but I have brought Eleanor on. <laughs> oh, Eleanor. Yeah, I haven't heard yeah, of her much. Hi, Eleanor. Where is she from? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Okay. I'm on duty with my granddaughter, but I, yeah, I'm from Washington, D.C., a native Washingtonian by way of South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. Good to hear from you. But, but yes, I um, we got a good listen today on uh, the on rediscovering and the re-announcing of all of the reads. So I want to go back and look over that. Yeah. Because, uh, like you said, it's culture as far as proud, and I just. You know, we use that statement a lot mm -hmm. about being proud of something or someone or, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a good accomplishment. 
So I was just, you know, curious as to how, if you wanted to say to someone how you feel about them when they, you know, when, when they're doing something good or something good is happening, how could you express your feelings? I'm so happy. I'm so pleased. Just like the father told Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay. Okay. That, 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 yeah. That's the kingdom language. That's the kingdom language. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's just like you say, it's just been, been custom to say and, and yeah. to do that, but I don't, I, I don't, and, and even though I use the term, I really don't see it as, as a, a proud moment. Mm -hmm. But um, like you say, uh, please be pleasing or supportive or however you want to express that. So happy as for you. Accomplishment. Uh -huh. You know, I came just came from South Africa. One of the things that people always say there is the shame. Whenever they send the shame on you, it's like a part of their culture. Yes. I said, why would you say that over people? Shame on you. Don't put shame on people. You know the damage shame causes on people. Mm -hmm. And it's part of their culture. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So people began to recognize that. Oh my goodness, I shouldn't say that. Even though it is so natural and normal mm -hmm. for us, but that's more natural and normal in God's kingdom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me, where's Armando? Is he still there? Or he is uh, Gotas Aromaticas. He's there. He's there. <laughs> he's on the other side. I'm in the computer and he's on the phone. Okay. okay. Um, I, Ram, I, I asked, well, I was telling someone, introducing her to the, the, the kingdom school. Mm. Um, she is uh, interested, you know, she said she was going to go and look at it, um, read about it. I was telling her about the kingdom and she says, well, you don't have to worry so much about that because you already are working in the kingdom. So what, 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 what is it all that about? <laughs> and because she works in deliverance and she says, I'm already working in the, in the kingdom. Mm. So I was thinking maybe she's right. Like you said, it's, it's, that's just a sign, right? What she's doing deliverance. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I concentrate so much on one thing, I could also could be uh, not taking care of other areas of the kingdom. You know, in Colossians 1, 11 says, God has delivered us and brought us into his kingdom. So the purpose of every ministry should be to bring people back into God's kingdom. So bringing back to God's kingdom doesn't mean going to heaven. That's where people think now they're in God's kingdom. They're going to go to heaven when they die. That's what, what it means. Are they walking in their purpose, in their calling, when they get delivered in their assignment? Do they have any awareness of their assignment in God's kingdom? Or are they just doing Christian stuff? Going to church, you know, mm. work on Monday through Friday, living like everybody else, and then waiting to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for Jesus' second coming. <laughs> yeah. Waiting for the rapture. So I have to go back and, and of course, read all of that you just shared with us. Um, because you said that what you were given, were given us, it was just the signs that we are in the kingdom. The kingdom of the, you mean, you said the signs of the kingdom, right? Yeah, the miracles and healing are the signs of the kingdom. In the kingdom, you don't live by miracles. Miracles are a means to bring people into the kingdom. Okay. You know, Adam was not living by miracles in the garden. Okay. So miracles are a sign to bring people into the kingdom. When you live in God's kingdom, there is 
constant supply of God's provision, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the culture of the kingdom. Then my question should be, am I living in the kingdom? What, how would I know if I am or if I'm not? Yeah, it's like if we are living, if we are fulfilling God's assignment, why he sent us to this planet Earth for? Are we experiencing God's provision for that assignment? Because that's what Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then all the things that we need will be added to us. He didn't say then go and find something to do now to provide for yourself. Okay. Like when Jesus met G James, Peter, Peter, James, and John, they left their boats and their nets, you know, whatever natural means they were providing for themselves, they transitioned into their kingdom assignment. Mm. Jesus was a carpenter, then they got, he got released into fulfill the kingdom assignment he was sent to this earth for. Moses was a shepherd, David was a shepherd. All these people before and after they were doing their kingdom assignment, there has to be that transition, whatever you're called to do. It's not always ministry like we think of, you know, preaching and teaching and praying for people. If that is what God called you to do, there is nothing wrong with it. But that is not all there is to ministry. God can call you to politics. That's your ministry. God can call you to do farming. That's your ministry. God can call you to an artist. That's your ministry. God can call you to a masseuse. <laughs> that's your ministry. You know, if that's what God called you to do, that's your ministry. Or a chef, that's your ministry. If that's what God called you. But we limited ministry just in the church, around the pulpit. Mm. Okay. I'm seeing it a little bit more clear. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And that's what the next course is actually discovering purpose, calling, and gifts. So please register for it starting in October. Uh, that is the second course. Then you'll have a little more understanding about this because this is only an introduction to the whole thing, discovering the lost kingdom. And the next course, we would deal with the purpose, calling, and gifts that God gave to us. Then you'll have a little more understanding about it then you keep taking these courses until you get the whole thing. <laughs> because like people are taking this three, third time, fourth time, because every time they take it, they get something new. Because we grew up in religion, we think that's kingdom, but that's not kingdom. And a total transition has to happen and it is a, it's not easy. Okay, any other questions or comments? Last one. <laughs> um, I'm, I always been um, attracted to health, mm. cooking healthy and uh, learning everything that it has to do with the body, the functions of the body and, and helping people, teaching them the different ways, you know, that we can change our, our health. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yes, massage therapy was one of the ones that um, I chose because I always like to, to touch people and I wanted to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I was always, always uh, attracted to, I actually uh, thought as a little girl that I was going to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. And then I went for nursing and I didn't finish. And then I went for nutrition. So I've been studying nutrition for the longest. And uh, every natural therapy, I, I always like to put my hands on. 
in order to give people different choices. And so since last time we, we talked in Chicago, Abraham, like you said, that yeah. that was or is what my ministry, my calling. That might, I, you know, that might be what God has called to you or a means to provide for you to do what God has called you to do. Mm. Okay. Yes, because I, I, I believe that and I believe it now more and more when people pray for me, they, some of them have um, said that I do have healing hands and then that I am too. Mm -hmm. But but then again, you just mentioned that the healing and the, the, the signs and all of that is to bring people into the kingdom. So yeah. Yeah. I continue searching. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I guess I'm going to have to finish the whole courses, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the whole curriculum <laughs> to yeah. understand it better. Thank you, Abraham. You're welcome. It's a process. You know, Jesus had to spend three years with the disciples. He didn't just lay hands on them and said, okay, be the apostles I wanted to be. He had to walk them through this entire process for three long years, more than three years, actually. So imagine if he had to do that with them, how much more we be. We need help. <laughs> we need help. Oh my God. Unless God helps us, we can do this. And He will. He's faithful. He's committed. And He will do it. Okay. So I hope that is everybody else. It's okay with everything. And we'll see you next. Monday evening, same time, same place for the last lesson. Thank you, Jesus. Exciting. And we will discover God's kingdom by then. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Hope you're reading the book, actually the reading assignment. And people again reading that book like fourth, fifth times, every time they read it, they get something new. So please don't give up pursuing it. God's kingdom. Seek it with everything you got. You will find it. Guaranteed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. I will see you next week. Thank you. Have a good night. Everyone. God Thank bless you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.